Messiah coming. It's all over the place from Genesis to Malachi. It's in places where you wouldn't think it is. You remember the series that we went through a few weeks ago that led into the gospel of Matthew. What did Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms say about this coming Messiah? Remember the road to Emmaus. Have you not read Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, what they say about me? So we just did, we got a little curious, and so we said, let's find out what it says. And we had that long series of looking at that, and I was immensely blessed going through all of those, Psalm 2, Psalm 110, Isaiah 53, and other passages like Numbers and Balaam, what God says about his kingdom, his rule, all of these things looking at a coming Messiah, a deliverer, one who would fix the situation. Even Noah's father thought that Noah was this guy. Finally, here's one who is a deliverer who was promised in Genesis chapter 5. Phenomenal. And so we, we, we asked, at this point when we're finished this series, where should we go? What's the next book? Well, the next book should be Matthew because the whole theme of Matthew is, what, Matthew 21, behold your king, quoting Zechariah. So the, the, the very smart place for us to go following that series is right into the book of Matthew where Matthew begins with the credentials of this long-awaited Messiah in his genealogy. And you have proof from fulfillment of Scripture. And you have proof from the Gentiles. You had proof from all these other kind of things in his credentials coming. And then you had the proof of the temptation. And then you go, Matthew goes right into the Sermon on the Mount to show us the difference between the religious leaders, what they're teaching, and what the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching. And following that, he's going into chapters 9 and 10, and he's going to show us the credentials of the Messiah in that he has control over disease, he controls the weather, he is sovereign over all these things because he's going to heal, he's going to walk on the water, he's going to feed 5,000, he's going to do all these kinds of things. Matthew is just piling up piece of evidence after piece of evidence to show his readers, who are Jewish, the Jewish readers, that this is the Messiah. Things that we're studying here in First and Second Samuel were part of Matthew's thinking Part of the background, even though he didn't express it explicitly, part of the background of everything that he said is right here in these, in these, these and other passages in the Old Testament. So I want to encourage you, though this may seem like long, and we've been here forever, and when we ever get done, we will get done, but I want to encourage you and, and tell you that you're learning more about the Bible than you realize you're learning. Because as matters come up in the New Testament, as you read this information that we have talked about over these past couple of year and a half or two years through First and Second Samuel, these things will emerge again. And you will remember, the Spirit of God will bring to your remembrance things that you've read and hear, and He will connect the dots. So you're learning more about Scripture than you realize, even though all of it may not be uh, practical Uh, everyday kind of things that does contribute to your sanctification. So hang in there, even though it doesn't sound like it's um, uh, all that relevant, it is relevant. It is relevant very much so. It's relevant because it's inspired scripture and we need to know it. So in chapter 19 of 2 Samuel, beginning at verse 9, all the way through the remainder of the chapter, long section here, 9 through 43, Uh, Verse 9 through verse 43, David is coming back into Jerusalem. Now, normally the words tragic and victory are not found in the same sentence. However, in David's case, they do. If it is possible to win the battle but lose the victory, then David accomplished that begrudging feat. The, The usurper to the kingdom, to the throne, is dead. Unfortunately, that was Absalom, his son. David mourned, he wept aloud. The men saw him. Joab upbraided him for doing that. 
And he says, if you keep doing this, by the end of the day, there's not going to be a man left on your side. So David was wrong in expressing the, the grief that he did. He should have done it privately rather than in front of his men. And all of that we talked about last week in the first eight verses of chapter 19, and that's where all of that is, is addressed. Now, going home is often a letdown, at least um, a letdown. If you've ever been away from home for a number of years and then you go back home, you discover that you're not really back home because things aren't the way they were when you left. People change. All the little details of habit and location are fixed in our mind, but that doesn't mean that all the ways and locations remain the same. I remember one time going back home and going to the little place where we hung out, where we used to hang out, and I went back there to hang out, and I didn't know anybody there, and none of my friends were there, and it's like, it's no longer the hangout. Things change. People grow up. People do change, even though they don't like to change. They do gradually change. All these things that are fixed in our mind, we expect uh, subconsciously perhaps we expect those things to be the same but in reality people change even at a glacier pace they still change the opportunity for David to once again occupy the royal throne had arrived Absalom is dead David is going back home but it is different this time there had been an attempted coup and that unfortunately stirred a measure of uncertainty in people toward David. So the outline looks something like this. Uh, Israel and Judah deciding about bringing back the king. That's in verses 9 through 15. They're going to decide, and much to David's surprise, Israel, the northern tribes, first they decide first to bring David back, and Judah kind of waffles a little bit. So in verses 9 through 15, deciding to bring, bring back or deciding about bringing back the king. And from that point on, you have a confession, a clarification, and the faithfulness. So you have a confession and the sparing of a man by the name of Shimei. Do you remember Shimei? You remember the guy who cursed David from the side, from the ridge line, and he kicked dirt on David? Remember when they were marching out? He kicked dirt on David and threw dirt clods and everything at him, and Abishai wanted to go separate him from his head, his head from his shoulders. Remember that? Well, Shimei is back in the picture here. So you have the confession, and David spares Shimei in verses 16 through 23. And then there is clarification and truth about Mephibosheth. Do you remember when David was first leaving? He came across Mephibosheth's servant. What was his name? Ziba. Remember Ziba? Ziba had a donkey packed with all kinds of stuff. And Ziba gave David the story as if Mephibosheth had sided with Absalom. And so David said, from, from now on, all of Saul's land and Mephibosheth's land is yours. Remember that? But David didn't have the whole story. It was a matter of desperation. He was just leaving tons of things on his mind. He didn't really even question what he said. But now we're going to have clarification from Mephibosheth himself. And then that's in verses 24 through 30. And then we're going to have faithfulness and the refusal of Barzillai, a man that we barely heard of before. We heard of him back in chapter 17. Barzillai is a man who supported David at Mahanaim when he was there, exiled, so to speak, and he was fighting Absalom. It was Barzillai who supported him financially. And David makes a great offer to Barzillai to come back to Jerusalem, and David would take care of him. But Barzillai is going to say, I'm 80 years old. I'm not any good to you. I'm, I would rather just go back to my, own, my, my home front, my, uh, the homestead, 
and just live out the remainder of my days and be buried there with my mom and my dad. Instead, Barzillai gives probably his servant, some people think it's his son, will give his servant to David and David will express his kindness to that servant for the remainder of his days. And then there's an interesting aspect we'll see, I believe, in the book of Jeremiah that's going to result from that. And, then fin- and that's in verses 31 through 39. And then finally, the last three verses, 40 through 43, is disputing again about bringing back the king. So you have the bookends there, verses 9 through 15, verses 40 through 43, disputing about bringing back the king. You have deciding about and then disputing about. And in between there, you have three groups of people that meet David. And we'll see on the other side, on the, excuse me, on the east side of the Jordan, before he actually crosses the Jordan. He's going to cross the Jordan at the same spot that Joshua crossed a few hundred years earlier when he, fought, when he came into the promised land for the first time. That's where David is going to cross there. And these three pe- groups of people are going to be there. In fact, they're going to cross the Jordan and meet David on the other side and confess and bow themselves to him and help him bring his stuff back over. We'll see how that plays out. So let's look at this first section, verses 9 through 15. We'll read it, and then we'll go back and make some comments about it. 2 Samuel chapter 19, and verses 9 through 15. All the people were quarreling throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the, Phil- of the Philistines. But now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. However, Absalom, whom we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now then... Why are you silent about bringing the king back? Then King David sent to Zadok and Abiathar, the priest, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah. We've gone from Israel, the northern tribes, to Judah now. Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house? Since the word of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house. You are my brothers. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring, the king, bring back the king? Say to Amasa, you, are you not my bone and my flesh? May God do so to me. And more also, if you will not be commander of the army before me continually in place of Joab. Thus he turned the hearts of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king saying, Return you and all your servants. The king then returned and came as far as the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal in order to go to meet the king, to bring the king across the Jordan. So let's stop right there and make some comment. After Absalom's troops crossed the Jordan River and returned to their clans, remember they fought in the forest of Ephraim, I believe is what it was called, which is on the east side of the Jordan, as you're looking at it, it's over here on this side of the Jordan, uh, north of Jerusalem, right up here. If Jerusalem is over down in here, it's Mahana, uh, Mahanaim and the forest of Ephraim is up in this area. So after the battle, the, the northern troops, they go home, they cross the Jordan River, they return to their clans. The northern tribes there means Israel. And they do so with news of Absalom's defeat and death. And so debates begin to rage about the nation's future, especially about whether to realign themselves with David. Is, this something, is David going to punish us? Is he going to hold grudges? Is it better that we stay away from him? What should we do? We're in a quandary here. All the people there, it says in verse 9, is the population at large, not just the soldiers. So the elders of those northern tribes evidently were together, as well as a good number of people. The discussion began to dwindle when brief periods of history stole the show, so to speak. They began to rehearse history. That was a good thing. You read some of the Psalms. Psalm 71, for example, is a rehearsal of God's faithfulness in the man's life. It's a prayer of an old man, Psalm 71. 
He rehearses God's faithfulness in his life. I remember from my youth up, you have always been with me, and you have always delivered me. And so now, in my old age, when I cannot defend myself, God, don't abandon me. That's Psalm 71. That's what the prayer of an old man. So when they began to rehearse history, how God had sent David to deliver them from the Philistines, they began to, it began to convince them that David is the right man. He's God's chosen. We need to realign ourselves with David. David had fulfilled marvelously the nation's expectation for a king. Remember, way back in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we want a king, we want a king. Israel needed a king, and now that Absalom was dead, whom they had anointed as king, they had no realistic alternative but to bring David back. And the separate treatment of Israel's and Judah's response to David shows that a deep traditional schism existed between Judah and the rest of Israel. You might ask, <clears throat> this was I thought was insightful, you might ask, at the, for example, at the end of Solomon's reign, uh, Solomon dies, Rehoboam, his son, takes the throne, and Jeroboam and some people from the northern tribes come down and say, are you going to continue your father's policy? And he says, uh, are you kidding? It's going to be twice as bad. Me, compared to my father, my father's going to be like a little finger. I'm going to be twice as bad. So the northern tribes, they separated at that point, an official separation. Well, where did all this separation begin? Where did it all begin to crack? Well, remember Saul was from Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. David was from the tribe of Judah. Since before David actually got on the throne over all Israel, remember for seven and a half years he was king over Judah. Remember that? And for these seven and a half years... There were skirmish, skirmishes between the northern tribes and Judah going on all the time. And finally, the northern tribes uh, came to their senses and they began to embrace David. And that's when, that's when it all, they, they put it all together. So this breach here has been, has been there for a long time. Um, probably the latter half of Saul's reign, 20 years Probably lied, lay, lay dormant during most of David's years, his 40-year reign. And uh, during Solomon's reign, 40-year reign, probably lie, uh, lied dormant for a, to a certain degree. But it didn't take much for it to surface. And it surfaced very quickly after Solomon passed away. And so we see uh, already here, we see uh, some deep traditional schism that exists between Judah and the rest of Israel. And that is, so some of these things that we've uh, read about in First Samuel are the beginning of those, those schisms. Now that the rest of Israel had recommitted themselves, David then turned to his own tribe of Judah. And that's where he begins to do in uh, verse 11. He began to do that. He called to Zadok and Abiathar, the priest, and he sent them to Judah with these requests, with these questions. Why are you the last? Israel has already decided to embrace me. Why are you the last? Shouldn't you be ahead of Israel in making this decision? So now that the rest of Israel had recommitted themselves, David turned to his own tribe of Judah. And apparently Judah had lent strong support to Absalom. Surprisingly enough, uh, David ha apparently had been alienated from key factions among the Judaites um, for the entirety of his public career. Calebites, especially the Ziphites in 1 Samuel chapter 23, remember Nabal? Uh, David didn't win any, any popularity contest when he, uh, when he did what he did to Nabal what he was going to do to Nabal, and Ab um, Abigail stopped him. But nevertheless, um, probably relations weren't that good uh, following that. So there were some sections of Judah that lent s strong support to Absalom, which probably is the answer why Judah was hanging back a little bit. For this all-important task, David did not sit passively 
on the sidelines, hoping that his own tribe would simply reaffirm their support for him. Instead, he took steps to solicit their acceptance, and so he turns to his, who is a key uh, supporters. Of course, the two priests are not from the tribe of Judah. They're from the tribe of Levi. So he appeals to these Levites here to uh, speak to uh, the people in Judah. He asked them to lobby his support among the elders of Judah. These men had proven themselves, that is, Zadok and Abiathar, they had proven themselves trustworthy. And in such times in which we're reading about here, Loyalty of the value of loyalty cannot be overestimated. If you're in the military, you know something like that. If you've been in businesses where there have been uh, churches, where there have been things, divisions in churches, loyalty cannot be overestimated. It's just an extremely valuable commodity that you look for in a person. Where are you going to be loyal? Am I confident that you will not be whispering? Remember, you, you, all of the dissension, all the divisions stop when you silence the whisperer, Proverbs says. And so David can trust these two guys, and so he sends them on his behalf. First, they were to inform Judah's elders that the other tribes of Israel had already thrown their support behind David. You need to know this, he says. Why would Judah be the last to recognize the king in the latter part of verse 11 there? Second, they, for David, were to appeal to the leader's sense of solidarity with one of their own, their kin. David was one of their brothers. We see that in verse 12. Thus, in spite of the previous support for Absalom, it was fitting that they should be among the first to bring back the king. Now, David's second step here, major step, was to enlist the services of Amasa. Um, The name Amasa means burden bearer or bearer of a burden. He was a key member of Absalom's uh, regime, which is now dismantled, defunct. Amasa was the son of David's sister, Abigail. Joab was David's nephew. Amasa was David's nephew. Abigail and Joab's mother were sisters. Is that family, how that family goes. That's 1 Chronicles chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17. So David directed Zadok and Abiathar to offer his nephew the position of commander of his army in place of Joab. Wow. Now, we know just enough about Joab's character to know that this is not going to go over well, right? He's not going to like this. Remember way back in chapter 3, 2 Samuel chapter 3, when David was warming up to Abner? And Joab did what he, he murdered Abner. He murdered Abner. Just say it like it is. He murdered Abner. David, or excuse me, Joab uh, did not follow instructions in regards to Absalom. Now, any guesses as to what Joab might do to Amasa? He does an Abner to him. He does an Abner. Joab does it again. This man started off good, extremely loyal to David. No doubt, extremely loyal to David. But loyal in a way that goes beyond the boundaries of the law. Beyond the boundaries of what is acceptable to God in, as far as a method. And of course it turns out that one of the instructions for Solomon. Jo- David gives one of the instructions to his, Sol- to his son Solomon on his deathbed. You need to deal with Joab. And he does. So Joab is dealt with in First Kings. <clears throat> all of that, of course, was coming. But in, in, here we have all of these reasons. So putting Amasa in, his, in this coveted, coveted leadership role would build bridges, right, with those who had served under him while fighting against David. And he would also discipline Joab for his insubordination in the matter of killing Absalom. That's probably why he did it. 
As in every previous struggle in David's life, his strategy proved remarkably successful. Most of the things that we've talked about this, most of the things that David touched turned to gold, so to speak. God blessed, remember, especially before chapter 12, especially before chapter 12. God gave David victory. God gave David wisdom. God did all of these things. She just everything he touched was blessed. And then chapter 12 happened. And one of the disciplines for chapter 12 is the sword will not depart from your own family. And the sword has not departed from his family. A uh, half-brother raped a half-sister. The other half-brother of the sister killed the half-brother who raped his sister. And now his other son has tried to take over the throne. And there's going to be more as we go through chapter 20 and 21. Turns out that God, that Nathan was right. So David's life is pretty different. His credibility to stand up and say, no, you can't do that. No, you shouldn't do that. His credibility is, is taken away to a good degree because he knows. He did it. He knows that God could have and should have taken his life because what he did deserved stoning, committed adultery and murder. He deserved to be stoned. God was gracious and not allowing that to happen to David. On the other hand, David's confidence and credibility as king is severely damaged because he knows in his soul that what I am telling you to do and what I should be doing was not, did not actually happen to me. And so I'm a little bit sheepish about saying these things because it, it, it should have happened to me. And, and who am I to, to, to announce this and denounce that when I should have been the one on the receiving end of this announcement and denouncing. Now that David's, uh, well, everything that he touched uh, proved remarkably successful. He soon received the uh, desired response, inviting him and his entourage to return to the royal city of Jerusalem. The Lord's hand of blessing, so evident in his earlier years had now cleared the way for his return from exile. And now that, his, now that David's reason for remaining in Mahanaim had evaporated, in other words, he didn't have to stay there anymore, the king and his loyal servants left the capital in exile, that Mahanaim, and they made their way down the southwesterly path as far as the Jordan, it says in verse 15. And taking the lead and bringing David back to the promised land were the Judaites, the people from Judah. So now we, we see where we're going now. Now we have the confession of these three groups. And uh, probably let's, let's just address maybe the first group and then we'll, have to, we'll probably have to wait till next week to address the other groups because it's... it's, uh, it's late already. So let's read verses 16 through 23. We'll make a few comments and then we'll, we'll pick it up next week. <clears throat> verses 16 through 23. Then Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, who was from Baharim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, with Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul and his 15 sons and his 20 servants with him, and they rushed to the Jordan before the king. Then they crossed, they kept crossing the ford to bring over the king's household and to do what was good in his sight. And Shemai, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. So he said to the king, Let not my Lord consider me guilty, nor remember what your servant did that your what your servant did wrong on the day when my Lord the king came out from Jerusalem, so that the king would take it to heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come today, the first of all the house of Joseph, to go down. To meet my Lord the King. 
But Abishai, he, here's Abishai again. He steps in. But Abishai, the son of Zer, Zeruiah, said, Should not Shemaiah be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? Then David said, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be an adversary to me? Should any man be put to death in Israel today? For do I not know that I am king over Israel today? The king to sh- said to Shimei, you shall not die. Thus the king swore to him. So here we have the confession and the sparing of Shimei, what David, how David, or what David does here. Well, his victory, David's victory and return meant it was humble pie for those who had openly opposed him. Remember, there were some people that openly opposed him. Those who sided with Absalom, now it's humble pie time. It's either get right with the king or get out. One of the two. None of those have been more vocal in their disdain for David than this man right here, Shemai, the tribe of Benjamin, having made a special effort to curse David earlier. Chapter, 15, uh, chapter 16 Verses 5 through 13, he cursed David. Now, according to the law, this was a capital offense. Abishai is right. He could have separated Shemai from his shoulders and probably been within the law, though the law doesn't designate exactly what can happen, but it is against the law to curse the Lord's anointed. Anointed. <clears throat> But he had, he of course made a special effort to do that. He was now among the very first to welcome him back and to seek his forgiveness and favor. You wonder what David was thinking when he saw this guy come down and bow down before him. I, I would be seriously, I mean, I would really be curious to know what David was thinking at the point. David recognized evidently the seriousness and the genuineness of his repentance he granted him that he might live um, he didn't want to have anything to do with putting anyone to death this is a day of victory he's coming back to Jerusalem but you should know that along with Joab instructions on how to deal with Joab there were also instructions on how to deal with Shimei as well and we'll see some of these things come out here This was extremely, what Shemai does was extremely wise on his part. But we have to say that David could certainly see through the artificial confession. Shemai was not the only one from Judah at the Jordan as the king returned. It says, with him were a thousand Benjamites, verse 17, including two especially prominent members of that tribe. It says, Ziba, the steward of Saul's household, and Mephibosheth, the only living direct descendant of the Benjamite royal family. And we're going to read about him in verse 24. He's also there. So Ziba had received a, a great favor from David not long before, uh, back in chapter 16, verse 4. You remember he was on the donkey, he, he met him, he, and Ziba gave this spin about how Mephibosheth had sided with Absalom. So not long before, Ziba had received a great favor from David and was no doubt anxious to retain the king's approval, Ziba was. The great favor given to him was on the basis that he deceived David about Mephibosheth's loyalty. But of course, David had no idea. He had no way of knowing at the time, no way of checking his story or anything. So this is wise on Ziba's part (laughs) because the king's back in town. The truth is going to be told and Ziba's going to come out on the losing end. So he better do something to ingratiate himself with the king and he better do it quickly. Same thing with with, uh, Shammai. The sizable welcoming party, apparently numbering in the thousands, did not wait for David to cross the Jordan. They went across to help him in verse 18. 
The crossing site was located approximately four miles east of Gilgal and was the same one used by the Israelites under Joshua when entering the promised land, back in Joshua chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. So, and all of this throng that's here making his way to the front of the thousands who passed through the Jordan River to meet David was Shimei, the son of Gera, probably still wet and disheveled from the crossing, Shimei immediately, it says, fell prostrate before the king and began pleading for forgiveness and mercy. As well he should, because he's going to need it. He admitted he had been wrong and that through his mistreatment of David, he had sinned, verse 20. Yet now the Benjamite was penitent for his sin. In a bold appeal for mercy, Shimei asked David to put the unseemly incident out of his mind and not hold him guilty. Verse 19 for these acts. Now forgiveness goes a long way, right? It does go a long way. David did grant him forgiveness. All these Benjamites that came with him. And by forgiving the Benjamites, he secured their support, of course, which was wonderful for David. <clears throat> a generation later, but listen, this has long-term dividends. This is what I mean by forgiveness goes a long way. One of the long-term dividends of forgiveness in this case here is that a generation later, and a generation in the, in the Bible is usually looked at as 40 years David has a few years left of his reign here, and then Solomon is going to reign 40 years. So a generation later, when the kingdom split in two because of Rehoboam's foolishness, the northern tribes and the southern tribes were Judah and who else? Benjamin. Forgiveness has its benefits. Benjamin sided with Judah. Uh, probably anywhere from, you know, 42 to 40, 50 years or so later, Judah and Benjamin are going to stick together. They're going to side with Judah and not go with the ten northern tribes, not side with them. Well, before David could respond to Shimei's petition, Abishai comes to the rescue, right? Sword ablazing and all that kind of good stuff. He reminded the king that, the one bowing his head to him or before him had cursed the Lord's anointed. And thus he had violated Torah in Exodus chapter 22 and verse 28. He had violated law. And for this serious offense, Abishai reasoned that he should be put to death. As we noted earlier, even though the Torah did not explicitly mandate such a penalty, uh, Abishai wanted to relieve him of any headaches that he might experience in the future. <laughs> David did not deny the offense or that it was a capital crime that Shimei had committed. He did refuse to mix this day of triumph return with the execution of a fellow Israelite. I'm not going to allow that these, on this day. Abishai had, because Abishai had stepped up, he had become an adversary. The word adversary there is the same word in Hebrew used for Satan. Almost reminds you of Jesus when he says to Peter, get behind me. Abishai stood up and the word is adversary. You have become an adversary. He, at that point, became an adversary to David in the sense that he opposed David's purpose to pardon Shimei. That's how he opposed him. So distancing himself, that is David, from the advice of the sons of Zeruiah, verse 22, David uh, wonderfully, magnanimously decreed an oath in verse 23 that Shimei would not die for his crime against the throne. Shimei admittedly deserved to die, and he would yet be punished in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9. But he's going to be punished, of course, on another day and for another reason. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 36 through 46. So 
Shammai evidently uh, had a, 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 a sudden brief stroke of hum- humility and he went and did what he needed to do, but evidently he did something else later on and, and the accumulation of these is going to end his life. So at that point, at this point, we probably need to stop because we're, we're a little bit over time here, but we're going to look, the next section is to look at, to look at Mephibosheth in verses 24 through 30 and then 31 through 39 is um, um, the man who supported David in Mahanaim and then finally look at the dispute in verses 40 through 43. Any questions about this? This is good stuff, beloved. This is really good stuff. Fascinating stuff. Gained a lot of wisdom reading this, learning how these guys interact with each other and what they do and sh- do not do, what they should have done. We can learn from this. Okay, no questions? Let's close in a word of prayer. <laughs> Our gracious Father, we thank you for this study tonight. We thank you for your word and the clarity of it. For giving us this text to learn to, as an example of obedience, a disobedience. We thank you for David. We thank you for forgiving him. For allowing him to stay on the throne. For the things that he has written that we can read about in scripture. We thank you that he is a man after, he was a man after your own heart. Not perfect but a man who confessed his sin, the man who returned to you. We thank you, Father, for uh, this study tonight, and we ask that you would make us people after your own heart. May we keep short accounts with you. May we be in constant prayer. Father, may we always give you thanks, always praise you, always look to you for wisdom, never leaning on our own understanding. May you be exalted in our life. Strengthen us, Father, to be faithful. Grant us safety this week, we ask. We thank you for the Rosells being with us. Thank you for their kindness. Thank you for your faithfulness in their life. All these years, we ask, God, that you would protect them as they travel, that you would grant them to see the blessings, the fruit of their ministry. May they be a great encouragement to many missionaries. Increase his ministry. Widen his ministry, Father. Grant him to have much influence. We thank you, Father, for Christ, most of all, our Savior, who has made a relationship with you possible. And in his name we ask all these things. Amen.